Okay. Good morning. Then uh, I am going to talk about uh, astrophysics, molecular astrophysics, about the chemical evolution of the diffuse, diffuse gas uh, to protoplanetary disks. And then uh, first I would like to say that molecular astrophysics is covering a very uh, large field, not only an interstellar medium and uh, a protoplanetary disk. Uh, we use molecules as tracer of the physical and chemical conditions in molecular clouds, in interstellar cores, in low and high mass star forming regions, in the solar system, in comets, in protoplanetary disks, in planetary disks, galaxies, and even in cosmology in high redshift objects. Then uh, let me also start showing the objects. James has shown some uh, some cases, some molecular clouds. This is a picture of the Milky Way. You see that uh, on the stellar background, you have a lot of uh, dark objects. These uh, dark objects are the molecular clouds, the, mo the, the, the objects in which we form stars and planets. Uh, typically, the mass of the gas in our galaxy represents 10% uh, of the total mass of the galaxy. And uh, there is a large variety of objects with a low density, medium density, high density, and very high density objects like uh, the disk of um, uh, around uh, newly formed stars. Here you have a picture of what we call both globules. You can have a zoom to, the, uh, to this region, and then we see that we have a large variety. This is the Horsehead uh, Nebula that is submitted to a very strong radiation field from a nearby um, hot star. Then the chemistry is uh, completely different from the dark clouds that uh, I was showing before. Here they are the cometary globules in the Eagle Nebula. We have a star formation inside. Again, the physical conditions are very different. And if you look uh, to the surface of these objects in the near infrared, all this bright uh, green light correspond to the emission of uh, very big molecules at pH. We don't know exactly what kind of uh, molecules they are. They are different approach. Uh, people thinking that they are um, polycyclic aromatic uh, hydrocarbons. Other people think that are amorphous carbon, hydrogenate amorphous carbon. In any case, we have molecules with hundreds of atoms in the surface of the clouds. And I am going to talk about, about what happens inside the clouds. This is the physical properties of uh, the gas in the interstellar medium. We have several phases. Uh, if we can uh, concentrate only in the, in the phases in which we have molecules, molecular clouds, we can see that the density is uh, around 300 particles. Temperature is 10 Kelvin. We have H2 regions generated around uh, a hot star, where the density can reach 10 to the fifth, and uh, the temperature 10,000 Kelvin. In protoplanetary systems, and the density change from the external part of the disk from 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 12 in the mid plane, and the temperatures change from 10 to, to 10 Kelvin to 1,000 Kelvin. That's mean a lot of change, and that's also mean a lot of the complication in the interpretation of the data. If you compare these densities with the densities on the Earth's surface, you can see that we have orders of magnitude about uh, between uh, the molecular clouds and the bodies of the solar system. And that's been also a very different and complex chemistry. Let me come back again to these uh, dark clouds. Here you have an example of uh, one bulk globule, very nice one. You see that it's completely dark. There is no way to observe it uh, in the optical wavelengths. This picture has been taken in the optical domain. If we can make a zoom, we can see what happens in, at the edge of the cloud. We see that the stars become red. This is because there is not only gas, there is also dust inside the cloud, and the dust is reddening the, the stars, absorbing the light of the stars. And then when we move inside, we see nothing, practically nothing. We can see even better here in this zoom how the stars move to be normal, to be red, and then to disappear in the center. However, what is happening in the center is really what interests this conference, is uh, the, <coughs> the new stars that are formed. Here you have a, a, a star inside a dark cloud uh, observed with the Hubble Space Telescope. You see only reflected light. You don't see directly the, the star. You have uh, this nice picture of a protoplanetary disk. You see that the disk is completely uh, Obscure. There is no way to get uh, from the optical or the infrared domain to get properties of this zone here. And this is the, the part of the disk in which the planets will form. 
The only way to penetrate is through the observation of molecules, because in the radio domain, at the wavelengths of the, uh, the molecules emit, uh, the absorption of the dust is, uh, is very low. Then we can penetrate and to study these objects. The only problem is that the sizes of these objects is just a few seconds, and then we need very big telescopes. You have uh, a very interesting phenomenon that is associated with the formation of low-mass stars and also high-mass stars, is that at the moment that you form a new star and a protoplanetary disk, there is uh, ejection of matter at high speed. This is uh, what we call bipolar outflows. You see here in this object that is called HH30, you see the protoplanetary disk. The light you see is reflected light from the central object. The object itself is not visible. And then you see this uh, jet arising from the, from the, from the central engine and this uh, moving at velocities of 200 kilometers per second. Very high velocities. That means that we will have a very strong impact on the ambient because at the moment that the ejected gas impact with the uh, protoplanetary, with the, with the cloud the, in which the star has been formed, we will have shocks and we will have the, chemi the chemistry. Then let me go directly to the molecules we have detected in space. We have something right now like 170 molecular species. Compared with the molecule that we can find in, on the Earth, these molecules look rather simple. We have molecules that have to um, well identify, I mean. We have the pH that have uh, hundreds of molecules, of atoms, sorry. Here we are talking about molecules that have been completely uh, characterized in space. There is no doubt about the detection. And then, uh, initially, we have a neutral molecule. We have also some cations. All the chemistry in the interstellar medium, you will see that is based on ion neutral reactions, but all the products are practically neutral. And recently, we have detected anions like Cn minus, C3n minus, C5n minus. You can see that we have uh, very complex molecules. Uh, they are radicals, very reactive molecules, like uh, this is the, the anions, but we have also the, the, the neutral counterparts, C6H, C7H, C8H. And these molecules uh, are. Um, producing a very interesting chemistry in the in the zones where they are formed. We have also molecules containing uh, uh, metals, and we know, and soon we'll talk about that in the in the in two, two talks later, uh, about the formation of dust grains in above the stars, in uh, dying stars, and these dust grains are made by silicon and metals. Why we look for low abundance species? Why we are interested in looking for more and more complex? Every time we increase the complexity of the molecule, in principle, so far, the, the molecules with a very large number of atoms uh, have lower abundances. And the reason is that uh, each molecule brings information from different regions of the molecular clouds and from any spectral point of view, from the point of view of molecular physics. Many of these molecules have been never observed in the Earth, and it's very interesting to look uh, about uh, the chemical properties of these molecules and to study the role they are playing in the chemistry of interstellar clouds. We need also to have very good discriminator between gas phase chemistry and dust grain chemistry. And uh, except for hot cores and hot corinos, all these complex molecules have low abundances compared with molecular hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and other molecules. As you know, molecular hydrogen cannot be formed in the interstellar medium through, through three-body reactions. We need a third body that is, in fact, a dust grain, and we are able to produce uh, molecular hydrogen in, in a reasonable amount of time, depending on the density, in molecular clouds uh, with densities of 10 to the 4, in something like 10 to the 5 years, uh, we transform all atomic uh, hydrogen in molecular hydrogen. And this is the starting point. We need molecular hydrogen. This is the most abundant atom. Uh, hydrogen is the most abundant atom. Then molecular hydrogen will be the most abundant molecule in uh, interstellar clouds. And this is the starting point for any uh, chemical process in, uh, in the interstellar medium. The second aspect is because we don't have photons. As uh, you remember the picture, the central part of these objects are completely dark. There is no way for the UV photons to penetrate in the cloud. We initiate the chemistry with cosmic rays. With uh, cosmic rays plus molecular hydrogen plus helium, we produce H2+. Plus. H2+, plus, uh, reacts with molecular hydrogen to make H3+, plus, and H3+, plus is the key molecule in all... Uh, sorry in all the process for the formation of molecules. As soon as we have H3+, plus, 
we have oh, with the reaction of uh, with atomic oxygen we have OH plus H2O plus H3O plus and then through electronic recombination we make water OH ato atomic oxygen and even molecular oxygen the only problem is that all these molecules uh, have um, the, the rotational transitions in the sub-millimeter far infrared domain, and so far the only molecule that has been observed in space is our H3 plus in the infrared, in the near infrared, and uh, H2D plus in the sub-millimeter domain, water, and OH. But all these intermediates were not detected um, before uh, the, the arrival of Herschel, or the Herschel satellite. I, I am going to talk about that. Uh, another way to produce molecules, as soon as we have the H3+, plus, is we react uh, atomic carbon with H3+, plus, and then we make CH+. Plus. CH+, plus react with uh, molecular hydrogen to make a CH2+. Plus. Again, with molecular hydrogen, we arrive to CH3+, plus, and then through electronic recombination, we make two molecules that are well known in, the, in space, CH and CH2. Then, also, by if used a few steps, we can make other molecules like HCO+, plus, that is a very abundant molecule in interstellar clouds, through the reaction of H3O+, plus, H3O plus with atomic carbon. HCO+, plus with, uh, through electronic recombination, will produce carbon monoxide, and the only way to remove carbon monoxide is through reaction with helium+, plus, H3+, plus, and photodissociation. This is the starting point for gas phase chemistry. And then the question is, can gas phase chemistry explain all these molecules, all the molecules that we have observed in space? And uh, the answer is, uh, in some cases, yes. In uh, molecular clouds, in dark molecular clouds, <clears throat> we have good uh, agreement between models and observations for many, many molecules. But as soon as we go to regions in which we have new stars and we have a uh, an increase of the temperature, but we need to model that using radiative transfer, photon transfer in molecular clouds. For that, we need collisional rates and apnesium calculation. That means uh, a good collaboration with people uh, doing uh, quantum chemistry. We need the laboratory spectroscopy. That means also a very good collaboration with people doing uh, spectroscopy in the laboratories. Chemical modeling, gas phase and dust surface chemistry. Everything is uh, interrelated. And we need also laboratory chemistry. Everything that is provided by the laboratory chemistry, by the chemical laboratories, is interesting to us. Then, if we are lucky, when we have everything available and we are able to interpret the data, then from the line surveys or from a specific observation of some selected lines, we can get, at the beginning, you can be sure we are very cloudy because we have many, many, many lines. But at the end, we can uh, report discoveries, and this is the way the 170 molecules that uh, we have detected in, Spain, in space have been uh, observed and characterized. Then uh, the molecules, as I said, uh, are proofs, and then uh, we have several re regimes for each uh, molecule in which we can get uh, densities and temperature using different rotational transitions of the molecule, uh, CO, the low excitation lines of CO trace low temperature and low density gas, the high excitation line of CO trace high temperature and high density. These are our instruments, you know them very well. This is the, the Herschel satellite that, that I have to say that uh, is providing a lot of interesting results, and this is the largest telescope right now in space, it's a 3.5 meter telescope. And the main strength of Herschel is the possibility to study water. That is, uh, as uh, the chairman was uh, saying at the beginning, water is an important molecule for, or maybe an important molecule for aspects related, related to uh, astrobiology. We have all the lines of CO, OH, uh, uh, atomic fine structure, and for the first time, the possibility to observe the hydrides that were missing in the chemical models that uh, I was showing you, I said that, that molecules like OH+, plus, H2O+, plus, H3O+, plus were not served because the lack of uh, instruments available for the, the observation. Here you can see the detection of OH+, plus. the line is in a source. Normally we observe lines in emission, but if there is a bright continuous source, the line can be in a source. You see OH+, plus, H2O+, plus, or the ortho and the para, components of the, of the two species of H2O+, plus, H3O+, plus, and we have for the first time a good idea of the abundances of these species in the diffuse interstellar gas. We have also other hydrides like HF 
that uh, fluorine reacts very quickly with molecular hydrogen and produce HF. And then you see here in blue the HF line with a lot of structure because the, this is a cloud with a lot of velocity component. And compared with water in the same cloud, you can see that uh, even hydrogen fluorine is uh, absorbing even more than water and is extremely abundant in the diffuse gas. We have also carbon hydrides. They are very simple, CH, CH plus, but it's the, the first time we can observe with high spectral resolution. And nitrogen hydrides, NH, NH2, NA, ammonia, and NH plus. You see in green the ammonia line, in blue NH, and in red NH2. Here the structure you see is due to the hyperfine structure of the molecules plus the velocity structure of the clouds. It's very difficult when you have uh, an observation in astrophysics to have just one cloud in the line of sight. Normally we have several clouds in the line of sight, and then we are tracing different physical conditions. Then this is the chemistry in gas phase in which uh, we have the starting point with molecular hydrogen and cosmic rays to make H2+. This molecule that we're missing, all these molecules have been detected now with Herzl. And what happens when the density of the cloud increases? Then uh, there is a good coupling between the, the, the gas and the, and the molecules, and the molecules start to freeze out on the dust grains. This is, for example, you see here the emission of the dust, and here you have a peak, and this is the emission of a carbon monoxide, one isotope, and you see that at the peak of the, car of the dust emission, there is a hole. That means that the molecules have depleted into the dust grains, and then we have a very interesting chemistry happening in the dust grain, grain surfaces. Here you have the distribution of other species. And what happens also when the temperature is so low and there is a very good coupling between dense gas and dust grains is that the reaction of H3 plus and HD is accelerated because H3 plus has to react also with CO. If CO disappears because it is on the surface of the grains, then this reaction proceeds very fast and produces a deuterium enhancement. In, uh, that is really important. In some cases, we see molecules with deuterium that has, uh, have an uh, abundance ratio compared with a normal molecule of a factor 100, a factor 10 only, rather than the 100,000 that is the normal abundance of deuterium. <clears throat> then here you see how deuterium is fractionated. You see H2D plus in red, the distribution. Uh, in, your, in yellow, you have N2D plus. All these deuterated species are arising from this part of the cloud where the molecules are freeze out on the dust grains. And uh, the models indicate that we need to include not only a single uh, deuteration, we need to include several deuterations in order to explain the observations. What is the, what is the importance of the dust grain chemistry? Well, we freeze out all the molecules on the dust grains. The grains will remain with uh, these ice mantles until there are some thermal processing due to uh, photons coming from uh, a new form star, or because we have a sharp, or UV photons coming from the out, from outside. And uh, here you have uh, an infrared spectrum showing, showing all the ices on the dust grain. You have carbon monoxide, methane, methanol, carbon dioxide, ammonia. All these molecules have been formed in the dust grains. And what happens when the dust grains are heated? is all these molecules go to the gas phase, and then you see fluorescent lines like that in Orion. This is a, a result from Herschel and the Exos key program. You can see a lot of lines at high frequency. Very nice, you see uh, this Q branch of methanol that uh, can be used to derive and the uh, physical structure, temperature, and density of the cloud. And we have also water, very nice lines of water here with a very complex profiles. You see different lines of the water, the profile in the same source, Orion, from the same uh, observations. And you see that the line profile change a lot, which can be used to derive the physical structure of the cloud, the chemical profile of the water, and so on. Even the sensitivity of our observations is so good that now we can detect not only HDO, even HD18O. That does mean that we can derive very accurately the Hanselman uh, deuterium by comparing HDO with HD18. And uh, just to, to show you that the complexity is really big when we are in the case of hot cores like Orion, this is what we get with a ground-based telescope in a few minutes of observing time in the three millimeter domain. And at one millimeter, you see a forest of lines 
uh, is really very difficult to interpret this data. You can see that we have a lot of U lines, U features coming from new molecules, for complex molecules, and to identify these molecules, we had to proceed in the way I was talking at the beginning when I said that we need a good collaboration with people doing laboratory experiments. Here you see the way we proceed to identify all these features. We have to identify all the isotopes, not only the molecule itself. We have to identify all the isotopes, three carbon-13, five possible deuterium, one nitrogen, and then practically this molecule alone is responsible for more than 2,000 lines in the spectra I was showing. Let me go, because time is running uh, very fast, to water. Water is uh, one of the main goals of Herschel, and there is a key proposal that is called WISH, with uh, Evin van Dishoud at PI, and the goal is to study water in all the phases of the interstellar medium. And uh, here you have several line profiles observed toward low mass star, intermediate mass star, and high mass star. You see how complex the water profiles are. This is because water is, is not very abundant in the external part, but is very abundant in the inner parts of the clouds. And then the line profiles are uh, submitted to strong effects of opacity in the lines. Then the Herschel results on water is uh, water is in the cold region is very low, the abundance is 10 to the minus 8 or even lower. But as soon as we have a heating source, water becomes very abundant and reach values of abundances of 10 to the minus 5, even 10 to the minus 4 in some objects. And the idea is to follow the track, to track from where water is coming from the external part from the envelope or is forming in the protoplanetary disk. Here you have a map of water observed with uh, Herschel, and you see water everywhere in this. Uh, this is a low mass star with a bipolar outflow. This is the bipolar outflow, and you see water in, on, in the central source and in the shocks. And the question is how we can study the disk. This is something that is interesting to know what fraction of the water is coming from the disk. And then the, the, the use of different molecules like carbon monoxide and water can allow us to study the different contribution from the envelope the uh, protostellar core, the disk, the walls of the cavities excavated by the vapor outflow, and so on. This is an example. For example, here you have the central star. The disk is here. This is the envelope in blue and in green, the vapor outflow. And then you see the different contribution to the intensity of serving CO. Then go, let me go very quickly to disk. We know from this that uh, in the near infrared, uh, in the surface of the disk, we have a protoplanetary disk. We have carbon monoxide, HCN, acetylene, and there is a region in which we have uh, atomic lines. When we, when we move inside the cloud, then we start to see some lines of uh, uh, H2O in the, in the mid plane. And when we go to the central, part of the disk, the temperature is so low and the density is so high that all the molecules are probably freeze out on the dust grains. And here, this is a, a description of what is happening. The star is photo evaporating the cloud here, the, the surface of the disk. We have organic molecules in this part. There is vertical missing uh, of the molecules. And then, in function of the distance, we have different chemical uh, properties and composition. Here you have some example of disk observed with the best instruments we have so far. Uh, the, this is the velocity for different sources. The sources are here, and then the velocity change uh, from the red to the blue part of the disk. You can see here, for example, this nice structure of the disk. Okay, then let's bear something important in the, in the disk. Depending on the mass of the central object, uh, we can have different composition, and it's obvious that low mass stars have abundances for the molecules that are higher than four intermediate stars. This is no obvious why, maybe because in the intermediate mass star there is no freeze out and then there is no this chemical richness in the surface of the, of the grains, but this is something that is completely open and used even when we have two, also, two objects that are identical, two T Tauri stars, we can have they are separated by one second, it's just the last transparency, sorry. Then we can have HCN in one case, and uh, in the other case, we don't have the emission of this molecule. However, in this case, we have HCO+, and in this case, we don't have HCO+. Just to show that the, chemical, the chemistry in a protoplanetary disk is really very complex, and the only way that uh, we will have uh, maybe to address the problem of the chemical evolution of protoplanetary disk is with ALMA. ALMA will be an instrument that will provide an angular resolution similar to the Hubble Space Telescope and used allowing us to observe the coal gas. Then uh, let me just move to the last one. This is the cycle of matter. 
uh, there is an important fraction of uh, uh, chemistry that is the, devoted to the bulb of the star, and Sun Kwok will talk about that. Then we have a continuous cycle of matter from the diffuse clouds to uh, dense clouds, it's a high mass star forming region, low mass star forming regions that produce maybe the air and the life on the air. And just to finish, this is the biggest, one of the biggest molecules, amino acetonitil. You see NH2, CH2, and CN. This is glycine, not yet detected. And then you see exactly the same structure here, than here. The only thing is that here we have the group OC, OH, here we have the CN. Maybe in the future we will detect uh, glycine, and maybe we will, with the new instruments, uh, increase the number of molecules that are maybe related to the, to the life and to, that will allow in some way to study the initial starting evolution of the Earth. Thank you very much.